All right, everyone. Welcome to episode three of the Hard Money Podcast. My name is Chris Casella. I'm here with Grant Smith, as always, and we run a private lending business called Sharper Capital Partners here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Grant, what's happening? Good to be here, Chris. Excited to talk about what is hard money. Uh, we were recently on an, an investor call or a call specifically titled uh, Passive Investor Meetup, which, again, I don't know if I entirely agree with that for the sake of uh, note investing, but that's what it was titled. And there was a good question in there that we kind of wanted to shed some light on. And it surrounded where do rehabbers typically draw the line uh, between private lending and hard money lending? So um, without further ado there, let's talk about some of the options that rehabbers have when financing their deals. Yeah, that sounds great. I think the first thing that we want to cover here and the first option that rehabbers have for financing their deals is strictly individuals, right? And there's some qualities of an individual and some pros and cons that we'll kind of get into here, but just to kind of highlight what this person looks like from the perspective of a rehabber, they may or may not have their own LLC, depending on how experienced they are, depending on how professional they run their operation. Um, And again, that's something we'll kind of, we'll hit on a little bit more later as well. They're usually local to the market that the rehabber is in. Um, They're probably using their own personal funds. There's a few different ways that they could be doing that, Uh, but they are typically tied to that person as an individual. Oftentimes, compared to hard money lenders or other businesses, um, they'll have lower terms. So when we're speaking about terms, we're speaking of origination fees and interest rates for the loans that they're actually giving out to rehabbers. And overall, they typically have a much less formal or a less formal process. And that could mean that, again, maybe they have their own LLC, maybe they don't. But in this case, that could mean that the borrower or the client has to actually prepare the loan docs for this lender because they just don't have the resources to do so. They don't have the experience or the know-how. Um, the mortgages are typically prepared by title companies. Same thing with the insurance. And one thing that was brought up on this call that we were on, Grant, was that a lot of individuals don't have something called lien waivers. And lien waivers are a protection for the lender. And what it really covers is, let's say a rehabber is going on a project and they're using subcontractors for some of the rehab. Well, if that rehabber doesn't pay their subcontractors, then that subcontractor could put a lien on the property. And then that lien on the property means that it can't be sold, you know, it's tied up in litigation and therefore the lender, the individual in this case, doesn't have access to his funds, his or her funds anymore. And I just thought that was kind of eye opening for us. Right. And and, in no way are we legal professionals, so don't take this as legal advice. Um, There's other ways around this with an indemnification clause in some states. Um, But again, consult, consult your legal professional in in your state. Yeah. And that's so this is just something to highlight. You know, this is something that you'll probably or potentially run into with an individual that you may or may not run into with a business, more likely not, but more on that in a minute. And then the final two pieces here is that the individual is typically gonna be a little bit more flexible than a business, but they're gonna be less professional. Um, This is general, totally general speak here, just kind of highlighting our our two options for rehabbers. And then in terms of getting connected with rehabbers, the borrowers or the rehabbers or the clients are typically going to have to, and again, those are all the same person, just referred to as different things. But for our sake, the clients will have to court the investor because if it's an individual lending on projects like this, they typically don't have marketing materials. They typically don't have lead generators. They're not going to be doing advertising. And so therefore, they're going to be a little bit harder to find for somebody who's rehabbing a property. And that pretty much covers individual if you want to hit on the business piece of this. Right, so we just talked about how individuals can sometimes have their own LLC set up, but we wouldn't really consider them businesses lending. A lot of times individuals will have LLC set up because they wanna receive tax benefits for just lending their funds out um, and, and being able to run some of their, maybe even personal expenses through the business itself to get tax advantages. But when we speak of businesses, we're talking about, you know, formed companies. These could be LLCs. They could be um, C-Corps, partnerships, what have you. And 
they're typically using outside outside capital. Maybe they're using their company generated earnings as well. Like the owners are putting their owners earnings back into the business to loan out. But nonetheless, they're typically using outside capital of some, some sort. And outside capital can be private money. So the individuals in the last case we talked about can sometimes go to these businesses and say, hey, I want to co-invest or fund deals through your business. And they can put their money into deals for a rate of return. Or, or the other outside capital source is institutional money, which is something you'll hear a lot of us talk about a lot. And they'll partner up with firms that will give them access to what is essentially a line of credit. And with that line of credit, they'll be able to go out and loan this money out that has an interest rate exposure to it. But they'll be able to go and loan that money out through their business and earn a higher rate of return. A term called interest rate arbitrage uh, is pretty common when you're referring to that kind of method. With, with these bit types of businesses, you'll typically see a few local ones pop up online when you type in local hard money lender or local private lender. And the, 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 the many national lenders will be taking over that space. You might see people like Anchor Loans. You might see people like uh, Lima One Capital, just big, big institutions. And typically when you see the big guys like that, they're generally using institutional capital. The smaller, more local guys that are running businesses in your area are typically using private money. These businesses are going to have a much more strict loan doc. They're, they're, they're going to come to you with the loan doc that they want signed. Typically, they're not going to have a lot of negotiation on it because they've negotiated a rate with their attorneys to say, hey, if we provide the information, these are the loan docs we want drafted. And it's just a better streamlined operation that way. And subsequently, the processes right are going to be much more streamlined. They're going to say, hey, this is how you get disbursements. You have to come with X, Y, and Z. Um, prior to purchasing the property, we have to run this background information on you to, in order to qualify you as a rehabber, borrower, client, whatever, whatever they're called. And throughout the process of running the, the project, the rehabber is going to have to provide some sort of update that way that they can get back to the investors or just the company can stay up to date on how the project's performing. So again, in general, these businesses are going to be less professional or less flexible, sorry, less flexible and more professional than a individual. Now, in, in this instance, like I was saying, you'll, if you type in hard money lender on, on Google, you'll see advertisements, right? So with these, with these businesses, you'll find them courting the borrower or the client or the rehabber as we call them. So the, the, the relationship between lender and borrower is completely inversed from the individual to the business standpoint. So individuals are typically going to get courted by the rehabber and then vice versa when it comes to businesses. And at the end of the day, you're typically going to see higher origination fees and potentially interest when you're working with a business. And that's because they are using outside capital. So in order to run their business effectively and financially, they're going to have to have fees and, and other, other sources of revenue as opposed to just the interest earned on the, on the loan itself, because they're typically selling or, or pulling funds in from outside sources to fund these deals. And then they're making money on top of that. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that highlights pretty well what, at least from the rehabber's point of view, what the difference between an individual and in a business really is. Uh, I think that kind of shows what their options are when they have for, when the, what they have for finding, financing their deals. Sorry, I tripped over my words there. And the second piece we want to talk about here is we want to highlight what is private money, right? So when a rehabber is thinking of getting a private loan, at least based on what we heard in this conversation during that meetup that we saw, what they think of as a private lender is typically the individual that we highlighted earlier. Um, they think of, of private money as 
an individual who might be financing through their self-directed IRA. And let's just talk about, you know, these, t- these people, these individuals that rehabbers typically consider private loans or private lenders, these people are either high net worth, meaning they come from a family that has done very well for themselves. And so maybe they got um, a large amount of money from their family. They might be working from their self-directed IRA. And that's someone who has worked for a long time. This is what it could be. It could be somebody who worked for a long time, built up a really sizable IRA, and they want to start loaning that money out to get a little bit higher return than they're getting right now. And like you mentioned earlier, you know, they could set up an LLC, get tax benefits as well. And the third option here is that they could be arbitraging a line of credit. I think this goes back to, you know, if they do have a high net worth, then maybe they have favorable terms with their bank and their bank is saying, hey, you know, if you want to use this line of credit here, you can go ahead and use this loan for whatever you'd like and you pay pretty minimal interest on it. And some of these people are very business minded and they say, okay, well, if I have this line of credit, I want to put it to work and make more money on money that's really not even mine, even though the collateral for the line of credit is mine. The line of credit itself is basically just an opportunity to make more money. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to you cover on that topic. Yeah, I mean, I, just full disclosure, right? We talked about how I got started and this is exactly it. Had a, had a decent net worth to my, to my name. And so I had access to this line of credit and I basically didn't even know what to do with it and funded this deal with it thinking I was going to have to put my taxable money to taxable money to work and come to find out I I was just matching short term, short term reward with short, short term risk. So it all worked out fine and dandy for me just to continue to arbitrage my line of credit. And I was basically making money with, without my own money. It was just turning, it was, what's your rate of return on, on investment when your down payment is zero, you know, it's just, it's, it's infinite. And so I, I personally go high net worth individuals. This is a great opportunity for them to go out and make some extra cash and, and and really build some wealth. The other thing I just want people to fully understand is with the line of credit, you're directly affected by fed federal rates. Um, so when you hear, oh, the Fed is raising rates, if you have a line of credit, you're directly affected by that. And it's it's not a uh, it's not like the mortgage market where it's kind of a blend, you know. Um, and the reason they're affected by that is because what the bank is going to charge you as interest for that line of credit to be taken out and, and put to use is directly tied to that, and that's yeah, where that kind it, of comes. It's in. just a it's just a markup of the bank's overnight borrowing rate, right? With with the Federal Reserve. And at, when we started, the interest rate was 1.25%, and now it's 2.75. So could this rate continue to go up? Oh, absolutely. And uh, are we We still, think it will. Yeah, we, we think yeah, it we will. we think and, it actually will. And, and that's why we're doubling down on this business now, because we know when there's a cash crunch, people are going to need capital to still fund great deals. And so even, even more excited to, to continue in this process and, and, and raise the outside capital needed to support the redevelopment of Cincinnati. Big time. And so, yeah, those are the three, right? When we think of people who are going to be an individual funding deals in this market, um, AKA private lenders, we think of people with a high net worth, people who are using their self-directed IRA, and then some of those people who are arbitraging a line of credit. Now, one piece that we didn't explicitly call out here, but also fall into this category is it could be somebody who is a high income earner and maybe they are, they literally just have a large savings account and they want to start putting it to work and they don't feel comfortable with the stock market or they've heard great things about real estate and want to get involved somehow, but they want to be a little bit more passive. Um, those, those people could invest as well. Very, very, very easily, very efficiently. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the pros of using a private lender for rehabbers. The first one, and this is going to sound familiar based on how we describe the individual. The first pro for a rehabber using a private lender is that you're going to get more favorable terms, right? If it's an individual lending using their own self-directed IRA, it's not a business like Grant talked about. They don't have investors to answer to and to, so therefore they don't have to use, you know, high fees, et cetera, to be able to generate a little bit of additional cash flow for their business. They're going to be more flexible and they're oftentimes going to be local to the market that you're in. And so those are all some of the benefits that you're gonna get as a rehabber 
using a private lender rather than a hard money lender. Yeah, and in terms of just the pros for the rehabbers and um, in terms of using using private lenders, you're gonna look for people that are local because a lot of the people that you'll be soliciting for your deals, they might, might, might be the first time they put their money into a note. And they're gonna feel a lot more comfortable if they know, hey, I'm doing a, I'm doing a loan on a property in this area. And they understand the market at least a little bit. Soliciting outside capital from a different area in the globe with someone who's not familiar to that area it's going to be a lot harder to convince them to go and put their capital to work, especially when if it's if it's someone new that they're that they're working with, it's going to be a lot easier if they are working on a property that they are familiar with. For sure, and I think even just kind of embedded in there too is is this benefit that if you're working with somebody who's local and they're an individual, their capital is going to be much more valuable to them than a business. So the reason that's important is because they're going to want to get out of that deal by getting paid. They don't want to take over the property, right? This kind of goes back to being more flexible. You know, they're going to be more open to maybe giving you a little bit more money to finish the deal, maybe extending the loan terms, adjusting their fees, et cetera, you know, whatever it might be. This person's capital to them is, is everything, right? So they're going to make sure that they're lending in the right market, that the deal, at least in their eyes, is going to be a good one. And they want to make sure that they get paid at the end of the day rather than you know, something goes wrong or something starts to slow down and they're like, okay, boom, taking over the property, you're out of the deal and, and you don't have a say in it. So exactly. I think that's a great, exactly. I think that's a great point, Grant. And then some of the pros for lenders, you just want to run through some of the pros for lenders. Yeah. So, um, again, th- for the lender, you have a direct access to the deal and client. So if you need an update on a project, you're going to get it from the source. If you need an update on the deal, you're probably going to have access to it. You might even have the code to go walk the property and you might be walking the property every single time you do a disbursement, at least you should be, um, and making sure that, you know, Hey, the material is here. Hey, the work is being done and making sure that your funds are being put to work. So that's a huge plus if you're looking to try and get comfortable in this space. Again, it can't be said enough. These are collateral based loans. So the second point for pros for lenders here is that when you have a collateral based loan, you know that, Hey, worst case scenario, I can take over this property, assuming, you know, it's free and clear of any liens. So just knowing at the end of the day, Hey, if I've taken over this property and I'm going to be able to have an asset in my portfolio, that's much, much, uh, it's, it's, I'm basically getting, getting a property at a great, a great discount to what its current value is. And the reason we bring that up, you know, that might sound obvious to people who are already in the business, but for anybody who's listening to this podcast and who's just considering getting involved in private lending, you know, the reason that we, we said pros for lenders here, and we're, we're speaking from the perspective of the individual who might be looking to get started in this space. And so if you're somebody who hasn't had experience either in private lending or in real estate in general, we bring up that point to make sure that it's something that's really highlighted because that's one of the biggest benefits of getting involved in the industry. Right. And the last pro there for lenders is setting your own loan terms. If you're, if you're going and you're going to be a note investor on the back end of someone's uh, on the back of a hard money lending company, you know, the, the terms are going to be pretty much preset for you. But when you're going out and you're working direct with the client, the loan terms are what are what's ever in your head. I mean, it really is that simple. If you want a point and 15% interest and you want to, you want disbursement fees and all that stuff, there's no reason your terms can't be exactly the same as the other hard money lenders out there. That's, that's totally, totally real. It just, it's whatever you want them to be. Um, and you could say, Hey, I don't, I don't want to do more than 80% of the purchase price. And you can do that. And if you market yourself, well, you'll find deals, but you can set the loan terms to whatever you want them to be just because you're, you're a private lender doesn't mean you have to lower your standards because, Oh, they're not working with a professional institution. Your money is your money. So don't feel like you have to let your standards down just because you know, you're a one man band. Right. And on the flip side, if you're somebody who just really wants your capital to go to work and you want it to be a little bit more passive and you find that trying to charge 15% interest, isn't getting you as many deals as you'd like, and you're comfortable with going down to 13 or, or 12 or, you know, eliminating your origination fees for a certain period of time. Like you can do that anytime you want. You don't have anybody else to answer to. It's your capital. So you have that flexibility. Big time, big time. So some of the cons for rehabbers, um, 
this is something that we already talked about, less professional processes. And so this is just, just goes back to like the loan documentation, the actual communication with the lender. It's not going to be as streamlined. You might not have software that you work with uh, compared to if you're with a business, you know, maybe they have a software, it makes everything really easy, everything's in one place. You know, all your uploads go to the same place as well. So I won't hit that home too much because we've talked about that a little bit. The second piece is that you have a limited pool of capital. So from my perspective, what comes to mind here is that if you're working with an individual and you're funding one project, well, if you're a little bit bigger of a rehabber and let's say you do, you know, 30 projects in a year, well, you can only turn that capital from that individual lender maybe twice, maybe three times, depends on how efficient you are with your projects. And that means you're going to have to get, let's say you're super efficient, you turn it three times a year. Well, you're going to have to have 10 individual lenders to make sure that happens. And that means more investor relations. Well, I guess it's, it's not called that. I'm thinking from our perspective, but more relations with your lenders, right? Dealing with different people and different processes, et cetera. Um, more communication, more time. It's just a lot more energy in general. Uh, so that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Is there anything else that comes to mind for yeah, you? Yeah, I just wanted to, in terms of the whole limited pool of capital piece, think of it like, oh, Tetris when doing a deal. If you're a rehabber and you're going about doing a deal and you know you have a screaming deal at, you know, on this property and it just happens to be a couple hundred thousand dollars, but all of the lenders that you work with don't have the money to fund that particular deal. Well, you're going to have to try and play some, some Tetris in order to get that deal done. They might have to co-invest or co-lend, get multiple mortgages on, on a property where um, that can be, as, as soon as there's a first position mortgage, it, it gets really risky for the, anyone else coming in behind. So let, let that be known. But it gets difficult as a rehabber when you have to go out and try and piece it together with multiple different lenders on one property. The, the best scenario for a rehabber is to have one person that can come in there and cover the entire loan, um, whatever that looks like. Just wanted to add that in there because it really does get complicated. For sure. And even if it is multiple lenders, but they all lend on only one property, that's still a whole... I mean, we were talking about this the other day and the way that we were talking about it, I think, is when we were writing the script is it's a whole other full-time job, right? Obviously, rehabbing properties, especially if you're doing 30 or something like that, you know, you're doing high volume every year. That's that's more than a full time job. That's running your own full time business, which takes up you know 100 hours a week. If you add on top of that, having to manage 10 different individuals who lend you capital, and they all have different processes, and they all have different terms, and they all you know, that's just a whole other headache. Um, so yeah, it's just a whole other full time job. Yeah, I, and I, I want to reiterate there. The people who are the individuals who may be lending out to you might not be experts in real estate like the rehabber is. So there could be a lot of handholding. There could be a lot of, oh, this project isn't going according to plan. Well, how does that shake up the client? And then just through osmosis, right? When the, when the, or not the client, how, how does that shake up the investor in the deal? The node investor. And when the node investor gets a little shaken up, sometimes it can shake up the client or the rehabber. And that emotional bandwidth there can really be deflating and frustrating or or just it's a whole other challenge in itself managing those relationships and uh it's definitely worth noting that that is an additional part of the job when you work with private lenders or For individuals sure. yeah and again we're talking about cons here so this is why we're highlighting this we are not anti-private lend lenders at all we love you know there's plenty of of great times where private lenders come in and it makes the most sense i mean especially if somebody you know if you're watching this and it's your first deal Getting a private lender is your best bet, right? It, it makes the most sense. You have plenty of time on your hands to be able to have that communication to learn from them and, and really to build that relationship. But we just want to highlight some of this stuff. Uh, the third piece here is that it's harder to find borrowers um, or far, harder to find lenders. Uh, sorry. Again, this goes back to you're going to have to court them. If they're an individual lender or they're a private lender, they're probably not marketing. They probably don't have any advertising going on. You're, you're going to have to network yourself you're gonna to have to build connections and and find these people on your own. And then this is a piece that we we really hit on. So the fourth one is just harder to manage relationships, and that's one we've we've really covered here, I think. So 
unless there's anything else you want to cover there no 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 i think we i think we beat that up okay I think, so Sunday, so. <laughs> I think we made that very clear <laughs> yeah so the last piece here grant why don't you just go ahead and talk about some of the cons for lenders when it comes to uh being a private lender as an individual or as kind of a smaller even if it is like a smaller team just being a private lender here right again one of the cons here is is also a pro but direct access to the deal and client means you have to actively manage that relationship and that deal. Just like where the the investor or the rehabber, I should say, sorry, the rehabber might get uncomfortable when things go sideways in a deal. Well, how's the lender going to feel when things start to go sideways? That's one challenge. Um, but then there's also the piece of the disbursements, having to go out to the properties, having to check on the work, making sure that's been done doing things the right way making sure lien waivers are in place, all that stuff. It's, it's not always super convenient to say, Hey, uh, you know, if someone came to me, Hey Grant, uh, I know you're, you're working your day job, but can you come over here and check on this property, make sure the work's been done and give me a check for (laughs) $25,000. It's, it's not super convenient. Um, and again, everyone can do it differently. You can, you can do wire transfers. You can do ACH. You can do all sorts of things to get around those things, but nothing really takes away from actually going out and checking to make sure the work's been done and doing the proper due diligence. So again, when we sat in that group and they're like, hey, this is a passive investors meetup. Well, in my opinion, there's really no such thing in terms of note investing that should be passive about it unless you're working with a company that's doing it the right way. But again, personal opinions are are for everyone. So right. <laughs> um, the other piece there uh, in terms of a con for a private lender or an individual not having the right legal docs and processes in place can honestly just make make your entire collateral non-existent if you don't get the right loan docs if you don't file them with the county recorder if you're just not checking the boxes you're, you're probably going to be in some big trouble when it comes time to litigate if things go sideways and try and take that property back over um, and, and, and it's to no fault of these people, but I, I used to do it when I first started in terms of going out and completing my own loan docs. And that's just not, not the, the best way to represent yourself or if you're representing other people and making sure that the, the loan is secured properly and making sure the capital is secured properly against the property. And then the, la- the last piece again is time is so important in real estate so important a deal can be a deal right now and 30 minutes later it belongs to someone else so in addition to making sure that in addition to making sure that you do have the funds available you have to move quickly with it and that's not always easy again when it's a three hundred thousand dollar loan that the investor is looking for and he needs to close in two weeks do you have the funds ready to go it's you, you got to go out and start doing your due diligence right away to make sure you can close at that at the appropriate time. Yeah. I really was surprised when they were calling it passive um, just based on everything that I know. And maybe they know something that we don't, but I, I agree with you there. So that kind of wraps up what, at least from our perspective and from the rehabbers that we know from their perspective, what private lending is. Again, that goes back to, for the most part, individually backed loans um, rather than business backed loans. And this kind of comes into our third section here, which is what is hard money and hard money is again, from our perspective, it's businesses, right? That's going to be the business that you described earlier towards the beginning of the show. So if you just kind of want to dive in here, talk about what hard money is in our eyes and in the rehabbers that we know in their eyes as well. Yeah. And I've been biting my tongue this whole time, not talking about this. So, I'm, <laughs> But the American Association of, of Private Lenders is trying to do away with the term hard money as a whole. And they just want to go to the term private lender. And again, I, I understand why there's a negative connotation kind of around hard money lenders. And, and we'll cover that here in a second. But the, the point here is that there really is no, there's, there's, uh, there's no industry standard in terms of saying, oh, like what's the difference between an individual funding a deal, like what's private lending as I think we know it, as opposed to uh, businesses, institutions loaning um, 
on properties, which was what we determined hard money or businesses. Yeah, and that's why I've been so clear, like telling people I know, on this podcast that this is from our perspective and from our rehabber's perspective and stuff like right. that. But it's yeah. just generally speaking, when we're talking about this with people in our area, because yep. maybe it's different in other places, I'm sure it is. Sure. But when we're talking about uh, hard money, we're generally thinking of businesses, outside capital. When we're talking about private money, we're thinking of individuals, their personal funds. That's, right. that's the key. Yep. And so... The name hard money actually makes a lot of sense. And here's why. And so I think it's kind of funny that they're trying to do away with the first place. But hard money corresponds with hard assets. So you're loaning on hard assets. You're loaning your money on hard assets. So hard money, right? Um, and they're collateral-based loans. You're loaning on a, like a, a residential or commercial property. And you can go out there and evaluate it. But it's, it's physically there. It's a hard asset. So... The pros for rehabbers, and I think specifically when we talk about the clients that we want to be working with, these are people who are trying to scale, um, are trying to make this a, an operation for themselves. The pros they have when they work with a hard money lender, a business, is that they're going to get consistent load terms. And that's super important when you're scaling and evaluating projects. You need to be able to go in there and 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 basically have a, have a model so you can analyze and say, this is what it's going to cost for me to close. Here's how much money I'm going to need to bring to the table. And you know how many do- deals you can do. You know what the loan's going to cost you. When you're working with a bunch of different lenders, in the instance of working with like a, a private lenders, you might get more favorable loan terms, but they may change and people might fall off the wagon. Um, and when we talk about consistent loan terms, it's important to note if it's institutional capital that's funding this hard money loan company, um, that's subject to change based on the, f- the federal funds rate. Um, and that's, again, because they're, they're typically using a line of credit to fund these deals. So the other pro for rehabbers is that they're going to have access to a much larger pool of funds when they're working with a hard money lender. And that's because they're using and proactively raising the outside capital. And so not only not only when that's being done, the you have... As, as a rehabber, you have one relationship to manage as opposed to the dozens that you might have if you're trying to fund an array of deals. And the processes are going to be crystal clear when you're working with a, a hard money lender. They're going to go out and they're going to say, hey, here's what we need in order to close. Um, and you're going to be able to build processes in your business so that you can go out and close properties quickly with these guys. And again, time is super important. So having that is going to allow you to close on deals faster and... Uh, just streamline your process in general. And that also plays into the fact that obviously we're moving, they're able to move much faster. Uh, a rehabber is able to move much faster with a hard money lender. The last piece that is often super important for rehabbers is they may not have great credit because they might have been self-employed in this business. And so they might just be living off the company earnings, no W-2 check to show for it. And so having loans that are primarily driven off of the assets that are being loaned against as opposed to the credit of the rehabber themselves is super important. It's something that we're going to take into consideration because let's face it, if a rehabber goes to a traditional bank and they're looking to get a loan, the credit of the borrower, the client, the rehabber is the most important thing to them. They want to know, can if, if Grant takes out a loan, can Grant pay the loan back? What is his ability to repay yeah. this loan based on credit score? As opposed to a hard money lender who goes, if they can't repay this loan, what do I have at the end of the day? That's the difference. So the pros for the lender in terms of working with a um, in terms of working with a hard money lending company is that and, and just just to preface there a little bit to make it crystal clear, oftentimes in the way that we run our businesses, we offer our notes to be funded by outside investors. So let's say you really do want to make it more passive. Well, we offer 10% interest on our notes. An investor can come in and say, hey, we want to loan on one of your projects. And we present them with a project and say, hey, here you can earn 10% on this project. Um, and here's the loan amount you need to fund. And we can take multiple investors' money and put it together, that whole Tetris, Tetris game we talked about earlier, to actually get these deals funded and closed. So that's one of the... As a lender, it's much more passive to do it that way. You're gonna you're gonna be working with a professional institution who's gonna be legally securing 
these docs. I mean, that's a huge part of the process to make sure that we're actually secure. Um, they're going to be using professional legal help to get these locks put these docs put through. They're not going to be working with the uh, clients ter- or the clients' legal docs. So you know that there's no conflict of interest with these things being drafted. Um, and the other thing that's super beneficial to to lenders especially is you're going to get access to great deal flow because us as a hard money lender, that's what we're in the business of creating deal flow, get as many leads as we can in the system and choose the best ones. And so by the time they make it to the doorstep of our investors, they're great deals that are ready to be funded. And then, uh, you know, the last, the last pro for lenders there that I really wanted to touch on was they're, if they're doing it the way we're doing it, they're going to be local to your area. So at the end of the day, you're still going to have the benefit of knowing that, Hey, when I, when I invest in this deal, I know, I, I, I know this property, I know where it's at. And, uh, you can see the value there based on, on what you already know about the market. Yeah. Big time. And Grant touched on this. I know we, we, we titled the section pros for the lender. So, I mean, in, in a lot of respects, th- these are pros for us. Um, but we really do want to highlight these are also pros for people who are investing with a hard money lender. I know, again, Grant touched on that. I just want to make that very, very clear that if you are an investor or let's say you're an individual who's considering either becoming a private lender on your own and putting your capital to work or just potentially investing with someone like Sharper Capital Partners or other people like us in your area and you're trying to make that decision, we just want to highlight some of the pros and cons based on each each of these different ways of doing it to make sure that you're making a well-informed and educated decision. Right. And there is some, we'll touch on this in a second, but there is some, there's kind of a balance here, right? Because not all hard money lenders are the exact same, right? There are some hard money lenders who, to your point that you mentioned earlier, are getting institutional back to capital and they're running this thing like a business. They're more interested in getting the asset as collateral than actually vetting the the individual borrower or rehabber. And there's some people who are a little bit closer to a mix of a private lender and a hard money lender based on the terms that we've defined in this episode. And I would say that we're closer to a mix of the two in the terms that we kind of marry some of those together. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but I just wanted to highlight that too to make sure that people understood kind of where we're coming from. No, ab- absolutely. Um, and moving, moving along to the the downsides for both the rehabbers and and the lenders. We'll start with the rehabbers. When you're working with uh, a professional business that's specifically originating loans for residential fix and flip properties or or real estate investors in general, real estate rehabbers in general, they're going to have higher origination fees and loan terms because they have to bring in that outside capital. They can't fund these deals all on their own. So they have to make fees in other places and that's why they exist. You're going to have less flexibility. We talked about that, but a lot of times what you lose in flexibility, you make up in speed and processes, right? And if it's institutional that you're, you're, you're getting your funds from an institutional backed hard money lender, you got to be careful because in a lot of times the markets that you want to be buying and flipping in, you know, perhaps on the way down or uh, at the very bottom where the, where the best deals typically pop up and no one has money. These institutional guys often get a little gun shy and aren't there when you need them most. The other piece and the last thing that's worth noting is you're going to be dealing with rehabbers are typically going to be dealing with national lenders if they're going for the absolute lowest interest rate and lowest fees they can be in terms of hard money lending. So you're not going to get an area expert that you, that you're going to work with. You're going to, you're going to get someone who understands how to write secure loans. They have, they have a way of evaluating, um, have a way of evaluating the value of the property and the value of the deal overall. And if the, if everything falls within scope and you follow their processes and procedures, you'll probably get a loan, but, you're going to lose a little bit of the expertise that you could get with working with a local lender. Right. And then the, the cons for the lender, again, this kind of goes back to the point where if you are an individual and you're trying to consider which route you're going to take, whether it's becoming an individual private lender and lending on these projects yourself or investing your money in a hard money lender, somebody who takes on outside capital, the cons for you in this case, it, when it comes to investing in another hard money lender is that there will be a middleman between you and the deal and the client. Again, depending on how they run their business, whether it's the direct placement model or the um, the fund model, 
which is something we'll touch on in later episodes, you may or may not have transparency into which deals you're putting your money into. And um, the final piece, it really just comes down to the amount of control that you have over the deal, right? You don't get to set your own terms if you're investing in another in another hard money lender because they have other investors that they have to answer to. They're going to have their set terms. They're going to have worked everything out in their business model. So if you are going to be you know, lending out on your own, you'll be, get to set your own terms. But if you invest in, in somebody like Sharper Capital Partners, for example, uh, our business, then you know, we have our own terms that we get and we've already set those and, and, and made those pretty concrete. So those are some of the cons if you're a lender, but there were some key points, Grant, I know that you wanted to touch on before the end of the episode. Um, I'll just go ahead and let you. Yeah, I mean, we, we covered a lot here and we, we bounced back and forth, hopefully as clear as we could between the pros and cons for uh, you know, the rehabber and the lender when using private money or, or uh, individual money or business money, which again, we refer to individuals as private lenders and businesses as hard money lenders, but there's a bunch of different terms around that area. Generally, you'll hear a negative connotation around hard money lenders because they are known for primarily serving their investors and not the client. And to be honest, it's not totally unwarranted. We see a number of lenders out there who make asset based loans and they don't really care about the borrower's ability to pay the loan back because they know the collateral's really good. And while that might work for some people, it doesn't work for us because as we've said before, we, we care because we're in the lending business. We're not here to take projects away from rehabbers. Um, we're not in the foreclosure business. And I always say this, always say it, but if we really wanted to own underperforming notes, we would just buy them. We certainly wouldn't make them on our own because it's way more profitable to do it the first way. And if we wanted the collateral, we would buy REOs. We'd yeah. Calling banks and getting all their, their underperforming assets. Right. Yeah. We are in the lending business um, and we're here to serve both parties. So in our opinion, the right model is to, con- to deploy a consistent base of capital, specifically private capital. That way we can provide consistent terms and we can responsibly evaluate our local markets, uh, markets that we understand and operate in, and make sure that we're underwriting deals effectively. And that's really the basis of our lend local, invest local model. You know, we want to we want to lend money out and we want to borrow money from from local. Uh, we want to lend money to local rehabbers and collect outside capital from local investors. Yeah. And, and done right, you know, hard money lenders can serve the client with a large source of funds that allow them to scale their business, gives them fast closings, gives them disbursements um, very quickly, and a bunch of other market resources if they're, again, local to that specific area. And it, it just never hurts to have a second set of eyes on the deal because let's face it, we view more deals than most people who've done them. You know, someone may have flipped 10 properties. Well, we're looking at 10 properties all the time. I mean, it's one, just, yeah, yeah. We're, we're flying through them. <laughs> right. Um, and for the lenders, they can work with an organization who has boots on the ground and can consistently and securely deploy their capital at a good rate of turn while providing asset-based collateral at a deep discount. And, and it's super important to mention, if you're really talking about passive, this is the least effort you can get in terms of deploying your capital into notes as a lender. For sure. Yeah, I think a good wrap up here is just kind of what we talked touched on earlier. You know, based on the definition that we're providing here, based on what we've heard and based on the rehabbers that definition, especially in that call that we were on, Sharper Capital Partners, so our business is a hard money lender. But I really do think we marry some of the best of both worlds in terms of being able to be more personal with our rehabbers, being able to provide that flexibility when needed, having that personal touch regarding where we are in the market compared to where our rehabbers are in the market, um, but also being able to provide them a consistent pool of capital, consistent terms, professional documents, and you know a lot of the other benefits that we talked about in this call too. And that's exactly why we've built, You know, we it's not by accident, we built our business model around these benefits. We've tried to marry the best of both worlds so that we can provide the best opportunity and the best experience, both for our investors and for the rehabbers who come to us. Because as you mentioned, you know, we're in the lending business, not the foreclosure business, but at the same time, you know, we're in the people business. Anybody who's in business in general <laughs> is in the people business. Right, right. And uh, the relationships at the end of the day are the most important thing to us. And, you know, we're gonna make decisions based on how we can operate our business the most effectively. 
but at the same time, you know, we're never going to go out there and, and burn a bridge or ruin a relationship or, you know, for example, let somebody take on a bad deal, even if we know that, you know, we'll be able to benefit from it because we can close on the collateral. We want both parties to be benefiting because when a rehabber comes to us, we want that rehabber to do a thousand deals. We don't want them to come to us and, you know, we profit off of one deal, they go bad and then they never rehab again. Uh, you know, we're trying to build relationships into the future. We're trying to make sure that our investors have good places to put their capital. And uh, like you said, done right, hard money lenders can, uh, can serve everybody. They can serve the investor, they can serve the rehabber, and they can serve the people who operate the business. So that's just one thing I wanted to, to kind of wrap up and highlight there. And I don't know, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up here? No, I, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. You know, in, in our business, it's, it, it's great when we can do a deal with a new borrower. It's even better when we can do 100 deals with them. Big time. And that's who we're looking for. We're looking for people who can be repeat borrowers and we can be doing deals with them for the next 30, 40 years. That's how long and that's how excited we are about this business. We want to be around for a very, very, very long time. For sure. And your reputation is absolutely essential. And so if we're going around being known as a company that puts out loans just so they can collect on properties, well, that we won't be around for very long. So right. Um, I don't know. Just wanted to add to that, that yeah. little piece there. Good deal. All right. I think that wraps it up. This one's a little bit longer, but I really do think we provided a lot of value here and we hit a lot of, well, hopefully, you know, I'll let you guys be the determin determining factor there. You know, let us know if we provide a value here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, comment on the YouTube channel. Let us know what else you'd like to hear. We have some more episodes coming here in the future. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, we'll go ahead and put our, com or our contact info down in the description. So thank you guys so much for listening. You know, I know we're a little bit newer here. We're figuring it all out, but I love these conversations. I know it seems like you do too, Grant. Big time. And uh, we're excited to continue going with this. But thanks again for everything, and we'll see you in the next one.